Here we go. I am Drew Badger, the founder of EnglishAnyone.com and the English Fluency Guide. And in this video, we're going to be talking about phrasal verbs, one of my favorite things. I've been teaching these for a very long time, uh, and they're really one of the most important things that you should be learning in English because they can solve so many problems with pronunciation, uh, grammar, vocabulary learning, and especially confidence and fluency. All right, so uh, if you have any questions, you can post them down below. But the reason I wanted to talk about phrasal verbs in this video is because I often get comments and mails from learners that are overly complex. And I also know that a lot of people are interested in learning advanced vocabulary, uh, but you don't necessarily need advanced vocabulary to speak fluently. Remember, these are two different things. Fluency is your ability to communicate, and you could be communicating with simple vocabulary or advanced vocabulary. Uh, and so vocabulary is, is a separate thing, and this is why children can often speak better than many adults, even though children know fewer words. All right, nice to see everybody there. Yes, I am here, I'm looking at comments. Nice to see everybody there, good morning. Uh, I want to get into this, uh, but I'd like to do two things. Uh, well, I'm in Illinois, look at that. Nice to see you there. Well, Julian is back, nice to see you again. Nice to see everybody out there. Uh, so what I'm going to do in this video, well, hi from Japan. Uh, well, nice to see you there. Look at that, everybody here from, from all over the place. Nice to see everybody from Brazil. As, uh, as well, we got people all over the place from Colombia. Nice to see everybody. All right, so what I would like to do in, everybody's so excited today. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, so what I'd like to do today uh, is number one, I'm going to cover a few phrasal verbs uh, that you may or may not know or that you might also be uh, maybe not using when you should be using them. Uh, but I'd also like to take some of your speech and make it sound much more natural and easy to remember, easy to say, by converting it, by turning it into uh, just some nice simple phrasal verb speech. Uh, so hopefully you guys, uh, if you have anything you want to post in the chat, like any, any kind of sentences I see, uh, I may take those examples and turn them into simpler speech, okay? So remember, lots of people are excited to learn advanced vocabulary, but you don't need to use vocabulary that's difficult uh, or that are like long words that you can't really remember. It's much easier to learn a few phrasal verbs, and this is really just learning some basic vocabulary and putting these words together in different combinations, okay? So you can learn 10 words, combine them in different ways, and then you have a really wide wide base of vocabulary that you can use to communicate with. All right, uh, so let's get started. <clears throat> uh, first, I'm going to give the more complex English, uh, and then I will give the phrasal verb example that you could use instead. I'll give a couple of these, and then I'll take your examples just looking at comments. So if you have sp uh, specific things you'd like to say just to test this out, to see if I can transform, to convert, to manipulate your speech and turn it into something much easier to remember and say. All right, uh, so the first thing, what's my first example here? Uh, so I'm going to write some complicated English, which is correct English, but you don't need to uh, express it this way. So let's say I'm speaking with a friend of mine. Uh, I'm talking on the phone with them. I don't have a lot of time to speak with them, uh, but I tell them I would like to speak more about how you have been since we spoke last. All right. I would like to speak more about how you have been since we spoke last. <laughs> And this is correct English. You can say this, it's perfectly fine to use this in a conversation. But let's think about the idea here. Uh, so I would like to be, uh, let's, the, the situation is like I, I saw my friend maybe like a year ago. Uh, so it's been a year and now today I'm talking with him on the phone. And so I want to speak with him about what he has been doing since we last spoke. Okay, so that's the situation. 
All right. So uh, again, you could like a, a, a non-native speaker might think about this. It's like, how do we express this idea? All right. So again, you're thinking about the situation. I want, I'm talking with him today and maybe I don't have time to, to speak with him very long. So I have maybe a five minute phone call, but it's been a year. I spoke with him last year. Okay. Uh, so I want to make sure like what's a very simple way to say this and a non-native speaker might become uh, very, very nervous or flustered about how do I express this? So how do we express this idea? I would like to speak more about how you have been since we last spoke. I would like to speak with you more about how you have been since we last spoke. Now, before I give a much simpler way of doing this with maybe three or four words, I want to see if you can express this in a different way. I'll go back and check comments, just let people try this. But how would you express this in a much simpler, easier way? Remember, understand the situation first. The situation is we're talking right now, just like I met him on the street or I'm talking with him on the phone, but I don't have time now to, to have a long talk or learn about all the things that he's been doing, all right? So how would I say that? I would like to speak more about uh, more about how you have been, so how you have been since we last spoke. I would like to speak with you more about how you have been since we last spoke. Let me check comments, but if you want to give this a try, try to turn this into some much simpler English, much simpler English. All right. Uh, let's go back and take a look at some comments over here. All right, Eileen, uh, Eileen says, that's awesome, but I also think the most important thing is communicate in a way even more people can be able to understand. Yes, this is exactly what phrasal verbs allow you to do. Even children can understand what you're saying. It's really that easy. Remember, the, the point is of good communication is not to be really advanced with your vocabulary. That actually can, can have the opposite effect, where maybe people don't understand what you're talking about, or they think you're just using big words to sound more important, but you can't actually have the conversation flow very well. So it's much better unless you're just like an advanced speaker and you know a lot and you're very confident, or maybe it's an academic situation. <clears throat> Excuse me, but it's much better uh, to just communicate simply and then people can understand what you're talking about. <coughs> mm, pardon me. Hello from China. Nelson from Colombia. Nice to see you there. Greetings from Ecuador. Bread and butter greetings again. Let's start. Let's get started. What's the difference? Yeah, there is no difference. You can use either one. Again, like often natives will have different ways of expressing something, just like we're talking about in this video. So this is my long way of expressing this situation, but I'm going to give you a much shorter one uh, in just a second. So show up and open your mouth. Yes. Uh, hi, teacher. Good morning. I'm, uh, let's see, Baharudin from Malaysia. Nice to see you then. May, may join your program. Thank Glad to hear it. <coughs> I'm going to pick my little brother up from school. Glad to hear it. I tidied up the table. It was a mess. Uh, what have you been up to? What have you been up to? Yep. What have you been up to? You can ask that. So good morning. So I'm looking for a phrasal verb specifically, but that's another good way to express it. How are you? Good afternoon. How have you been? Hey, Drew and everybody. Guys, what time is it in your place? It's 940 a.m. Good morning. Right now in Japan, it is uh, 1040. So we are uh, an hour later, I guess. All right. Let me just get right to this. So we should catch up. We should catch up. That's it. This whole idea, all of these words can just be summed up like this. Four words. We should catch up. So this phrasal verb here, the most important part of this, we should catch up. It just means, let me, let me give you a, a bit of background about this. You've probably heard this before, but you can imagine the idea of this coming from like two people uh, like running and one person is behind the other one and he has to run faster to catch up to this person who's running. So if you've got two people running like this, one up like this, whoa, we're catching up, whoa, and I caught up to that person. Or if I'm maybe behind in my school studying, maybe I was sick for a week and uh, all of my other friends at school in the class, so they're on page 34, but I'm still on page 22. So I need to read all of those pages to catch up to where they are, okay? So the same idea here, I need to talk about, wow, we should catch up. 
We should get caught up. We should learn about what's happening. So we want to catch up with an old friend, or I have been catching up with an old friend, or I have a lot of catching up to do at work. So again, I'm behind on my work. The opposite of this is the, the idea of being behind on something. <clears throat> so I should be doing a lot of work, but maybe I was sick. I was in the hospital. I couldn't do anything. And so I need to catch up on that all right so remember it's rather than trying to think about this it can be a very difficult process to try to think about this i would like to speak more about how you have been since we last spoke this is correct english you can use this but natives will just say we should catch up natives are not trying to speak more words they don't want to use more words just for no reason we want to just communicate quickly. Let's get the idea out, understand what the other person is saying, communicate what we want to say. Very nice and easy. All right. Any questions about that? I think people got it though. All right. So catch up, catch up, catch up. I'm from Brazil, by the way. I would like to be more precise when talking to other people in English. Yep. So this is another good way to do this. The precision comes when you begin with something smaller like something shorter like this, and then expand that if you need to, all right? So if you're trying to be more precise with your English, maybe I'll make a video about this, uh, but often people begin with something bigger and then try to edit it down. I mean, it's much more simple to, to or much easier to begin with something simple and then expand that if the other person still doesn't know what you're talking about, all right? So if I say, yes, I bought a, uh, a tegu, I bought... A tegu. Now people might say, what's a tegu? What do, you, what do you mean by that? What's a tegu? Oh, it's a kind of lizard. So maybe people just don't know what that thing is. Oh, it's the a, it's a name of an animal. I bought a tegu or I bought whatever. So I begin with something short and I expand upon that if I need to, if the other person doesn't know what I'm talking about. But I don't start with something long if they already understand. Yes, I bought a tegu that came from this uh, special pet store that uh, needed to do this or that. Like, unless I want to tell some story, maybe that's interesting for people, maybe it's not. But it's much easier to begin with something simple, and that's how we can expand out to make it much easier to communicate, all right? So we want to go for simplicity, and hopefully this makes sense over here. Do you have a list of 100 most important? Yes, I know people, you can find that online. Just look for if you want like the most you know, important phrases or most important words or whatever, but most people who are studying from those lists are not speaking fluently, all right? Hey, it's been ages since we hung out. We should catch up soon. Yep, we should catch up. We should catch up, all right? Now remember, we, we don't want to begin with lists of words. We want to begin with situations and then understand what's happening in that. But this is, again, two ways that we can explain the same thing. This is a much more simple and natural one. It's easier to remember and it will allow you to communicate fluently. Hey, it's been a while. We should catch up. Hey, I need to catch up on my work. Okay. All right. Let's move on to the next one. Very simple. I just wanted to give a couple of these. And then we'll go back to uh, the comments section and see if anybody has any questions. Or I can take other people's comments and convert them into simpler English. All right. Uh, next one. This is an oftenly, often used phrase. So we should continue doing... So we should continue doing the plan we are doing. <laughs> we should continue doing the plan we are doing or we should continue our plan. Can we think of a much simpler, shorter way to do this with a phrasal verb, all right? Now this video is focused on phrasal verbs, but I could probably give you 10 different ways to express this same situation. Again, the goal is beginning with the situation, thinking about it like a native, knowing some different ways of expressing that. So if you forget one, you can easily switch to another one. Natives do this all the time. I'm doing it actually right now when I'm speaking with you. So I'm thinking about something, I want to express something, but it, the words just flow naturally, even though I'm, I might not 
you know, you, you don't really notice it because I'm doing it so quickly, but I might be thinking of one thing and then I think of some better words to express that and I just keep flowing like that. I call this moving like water and that's what you get when you can speak fluently. All right, so we should continue doing the plan we are doing. Let's not change anything. Uh, and let's see, we should stick to our plan. Boom, you got it. Who is that? Rodrigo, nice work. Stick to, all right? Stu, uh, to stick to is a very useful word that you can use instead of the word continue. So we should stick to the plan. All right, so it just means to follow something, to continue doing something, all right? To stick to that thing. Just like if I have a magnet, this is actually not a magnetic eraser, but in a, a magnetic eraser could, Stick to, stick to, okay? So just like, well, not, maybe I get my shirt all wet and now my shirt is sticking to me, all right? So just like, they stick together. So we should stick to that, all right? Now, once you understand the phrasal verb, it's like, oh, look at that, like a sticker sticks to something else. And so we can take that and we start using this same situation of being connected, continuing, all of those same things. We begin with the situation though. We don't begin with the phrasal verb. That's why I'm teaching it this way. So you notice I don't introduce the phrasal verb first and then explain it. I begin with the situation and then reveal the phrasal verb. Okay, this is how natives are learning the language. So little kids, they see a situation or well, their mother says like, oh wait, while we're walking through the grocery store, don't get lost, stick to me. All right, let's stick together so you don't get lost. And so the child understands, oh, like, just like a sticker, you know, I need to be, you know, close to my mother. I shouldn't just wander off and get lost in the grocery store. So stick to, we should stick to the plan. Stick to the plan. I should stick to maybe my diet, stick to my diet. And of course we get a fire engine right on cue, right on cue. All right, so to stick to something, it just means to continue something, to, to follow something, but we begin again with the situation. We should continue, we should follow the plan we are doing, or we should stick to the plan. Stick to the plan. Don't try to do anything different. Just keep doing what you're doing. I'm having trouble sticking to my diet. I'm having trouble sticking to my diet. So I really want to lose weight. I'm having trouble, you know, I don't really want to stick to my exercise routine. Okay, so you can see how we begin with something physical like sticking to, being connected in some way, but we can use this when we're talking about something figurative. Like I'm not, I'm not physically stuck to my diet, it's just something I'm doing, all right? But I'm sticking to the thing I want to do. I stick to my gluten-free diet. Yes, yeah, so if you have a gluten-free diet or whatever it is, stick to that, all right? You should stick to learning English like a native speaker if you want to understand English and speak fluently. All right, stick to. All right, I think everybody got that one. Very good. Let's try another one. Shall we try another one? All right. Let's see. I would like to, let's see. So I would like to get more into detail I would like to get more into detail uh, or get more in detail or get more into detail about your ideas. So we can imagine this is a uh, professional setting. Maybe I'm at a meeting right now and someone says, well, I would like to get more into detail about your ideas. So maybe I introduce something. I'm talking about, you know, whatever my, my project or something. <clears throat> and my boss says, oh, well, I would love to, I would love to like find out more information about those ideas. So my boss is interested in what I'm saying and he would like to get more into detail. So this is really the key word here, the key words, and to get more into detail. Can anyone think of a way to express that? There might be more than one. Actually, I guarantee there are more than one, but see if you can think of one. I have one in my mind already I'm thinking about, but think about just a very simple way to express this with a phrasal verb. All right, notice all the phrasal verbs we've covered so far, the two we've covered so far, we've got stick 
two, just like we've got stick together. Uh, and then we also have, what do we have? We have ketchup, ketchup, so very simple. I would like to go home. I would like to go home. <laughs> You'd like to go home. All right, well, you, sh you should go home. <laughs> Follow up on your idea. All right, now follow up is a phrasal verb, but follow up implies that you're going to talk about something at another time, to follow up on that, all right? So you can imagine just like some people walking here. So the first person is walking, yep, it's like I'll follow up, I'll follow you later, all right? That's to follow up. Like you might have a follow up phone call with someone. I have a follow up meeting. So we have our first meeting today and another meeting later. This is the second meeting, the follow-up meeting about that, all right? So I would like to get more into detail about your ideas, about your, excuse me, about your ideas. Very simply, let's let's dig into your idea. All right, so to dig into, all right, you can imagine like a hole right here and I'm gonna, gonna go deeper and deeper and deeper. I'm digging into that, just like I have a shovel and I'm digging in, trying to get more information, more details. Let's dig into, all right? Now notice there, I'm, I'm also making the sentences a little bit easier, a little bit simpler, but I'm changing the meaning slightly. I would like to, is really formal, very proper English, uh, and it's certainly fine to use that. Uh, but typically, if you want to be a bit more certain, if you want to be, especially like a boss that's saying, that's trying to, to, to be decisive, to try to tell people, hey, we, like, let's do this. Typically, uh, like the boss or the leader of a company would not be saying, I would like to do this. They're just like, I would like to. No, 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 let's, let's do it, let's do this, okay? So when you want to, like, it's still, it's still pretty polite. You're not telling someone to do someone or do something. It's just, hey, we should do this. Uh, let's do this. Let's do this. So your tone of voice becomes important. But I want to dig into something. I want to learn more about this in a detailed, deep way. Let's dig into that. Okay? I don't think we had any questions about that. So look more into the details, walk me through. Yeah, to walk me through something is another good way of saying that, very good. So to walk someone through, imagine I'm giving someone a tour of a house. So I'm like a real estate agent and I'm, I'm walking them physically through the house. Like walk with me and I will show you here's the bedroom and here's the kitchen and here's upstairs. I'm walking you through the house. So we physically walk someone through something or we can figuratively walk someone through something like a plan. Let me walk you through the plan. Let me walk you through the plan. All right, so first we do this thing, then this thing over here, then we try something different. Let me walk you through the plan. All right, could also be dive into. Yes, Roderico, I was also thinking about dive into. That would be another good one. Very good. You can be the new English teacher out here. Very good. All right, to dive into. Same idea. Notice how native speakers will often have multiple ways of saying something. All right, I keep coming back to this idea. We begin with a situation and then learn the vocabulary used for it. Okay, we don't start with a list of phrasal verbs. We begin with a situation. Very soon I'll be releasing actually uh, a guide to phrases on our site. We don't have it available yet. Uh, but it will be up there soon, but it takes the same idea, like what to say when you're frustrated or what to say uh, when you make a mistake or what do you say, you know, those kinds of things. So we want to begin with the situation and learn different ways of expressing that the same way a native would learn them. All right. Cloud, you describe your, you say could, maybe could you describe your idea detailedly? Uh, usually we just say in detail if we, if we need to say that. Okay. Now, sometimes people like to use longer phrases and expressions. That's perfectly fine, but often just being simple and clear and making sure people understand that's really the best thing you can do. So dig into more. Yes, uh, we need to dig, plan to dig in more thoroughly. Yes, you want to dive in or you want to dig into something more thoroughly. Okay, you can also dig in, like dig into your lunch. <laughs> so like it's kind of a very casual way of saying let's eat. All right, everybody, dig in. 
Everybody can start eating right now. Let's dig in. Don't be, don't be shy. You can enjoy your lunch. All right, Julian says, we need some fresh ideas for our marketing pan campaign. Let's dig into your ideas and see if we can come up with something innovative. Yep. So again, you can say all of that, but often uh, a lot of people would have trouble trying to communicate all of that in a very fluent and natural way. So it's much easier to say, yeah, I like your ideas. Let's dig more into that. Very simple. All right, very easy. All right, I think we're going well. Let's see, we're at 25 minutes, look at that. 25 minutes, fantastic. Not going too long with this video. All right, we'll do a few more, and then I'll look at any comments people have and see if anybody can, can have their, their speech or their writing converted over here. All right, uh, now this is another, uh, another kind of uh, basic idea, let's see. Uh, I made I made a mistake and All right, hopefully everyone can read this. I'll read it for you though. I made a mistake and caused Whoops, I wrote and twice. <laughs> I made a mistake and caused a lot of chaos and confusion. I made a mistake and caused a lot of chaos and confusion. So chaos is things happening. There's, uh, it's really the opposite of things being controlled. So I, 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 I created a, a really big problem, all right? This is correct English. This is perfectly fine to use. Oh no, I created a huge problem. I made a mistake and caused a lot of chaos and confusion, all right? Can you think of a much simpler way to express this? Remember the idea, that, so the words are really expressing an idea, the situation. I created a problem, so it's my fault, and now things are, are not going well. <laughs> so I created a problem, uh, I created chaos and confusion. Ah, I screwed up. Screwed up. Yeah, I screwed up. That's a good way. I screw up. Yep. That's not the one I was thinking of, but very good. Very good to screw up. I was thinking I messed up. Same idea. All right. So I screwed up. I messed up. The same thing. Very simple. So I made a mistake and caused a lot of chaos and confusion. I made a mistake or I caused a problem. These are all same thing. Nice and easy. I screwed up. I messed up. All right. You probably have even heard like, oh, I fucked up. You know, that's the, uh, if you want to be cursing. <laughs> Same idea. All right. I screwed up. I messed up. So if you take, imagine like sometimes my, my two daughters will be jumping on a bed at home and there will be some nice folded laundry on the bed and the, and the laundry will get all messed up. So they have to go back and fix all that. All right. So to mess something up, to make it messy, make it messy. Often you'll hear just having like these kind of uh, additional preposition added there just to make it sound a bit more natural. Like I ate all my food up. I ate it up. I ate up everything. All right. So you can say I ate, but I ate up everything. It just sounds a bit more casual and conversational. All right. So I messed up. In these cases, we don't just say I messed or I screwed. Uh, those would be different things. Uh, I messed isn't really like a verb by itself, uh, but messed up is the thing you, you blew it. <laughs> That's right. So if you want to talk about someone else who messes up, oh no, you blew it. You messed up. You messed up. So here I'm talking about me, myself. I made a mistake. I made a mistake, but you messed up if you want to talk about someone else. Thank you for your teaching. It's my pleasure. All right. This one should be pretty easy. You've probably heard this before, but you can imagine all of the different situations that might be used for messed up, screwed up. You can use this in professional situations as well. Oh no, I made a terrible mistake. Again, uh, it's much better if you're using this referring to yourself. I don't want to talk about other people like, oh no, you messed up or you screwed up. Uh, that's a very, it's a very harsh. If you remember that word, very harsh way of describing that for someone else, you can make them feel much worse. So they already caused a problem and probably feel bad about that. Uh, but if you're talking about yourself, you can be 
you know, that's fine if, if you want to say something more difficult uh, or maybe a bit, a bit harsher on yourself, all right? I think everybody got that one too. We'll do the last one and then I'll go back and see if anybody has. Whoa. My board almost fell down on me. Almost a fell down, fell down. Or I could say fell over. Look at how useful phrasal verbs are. So we have something like this, you know, fell over, fell over. You can also use fall down for this. Fall down is typically going straight down like that, fall down. All right, last one. My car had engine. My car had engine trouble and now it is not working. My car had engine trouble and now it is not working. My car had engine trouble and now it is not working. Can you think of a much simpler, shorter way to express this? How can we describe this like a native? How would a native say this? So the native is talking about the situation. Oh no, there's a problem with the car. <laughs> you messed up again. Well, uh, it might not be your fault. Maybe just something happened with the car. So we wouldn't really say the car messed up something. Uh, certainly something wrong with the car. What, Roderico again? Oh my goodness. Broke down. My car broke down. Another one, another good one. My car is acting up. Now, acting up is a slightly different situation. If I'm driving down the street and I can still move, so there's something like my car is still operating, it's still moving, but I hear maybe like some kind of weird sound, I, my, my car is acting up again. My car is acting up again. This is the same way we would describe children who are causing trouble. Stop acting up in school or acting out in school, same way. All right, so my car is acting up. There's a problem with it, but it's still moving. But a breakdown, woo, that's it. Your car is finished. It's not moving at all. You have to get it fixed. Uh, maybe take it to, a, uh, to the repair place, the mechanic, and then we can get it fixed, all right? Actually, who knows, who knows a native way of talking about a car mechanic or auto mechanic? What do we call that? So my car, just I'll give you an extra example here. So my car is at the auto the auto mechanic my car is at the auto mechanic so this is a place that would fix your car but how do natives say this all right natives could say this my car is at the auto mechanic but typically we would not use that all right it's much simpler it's a four letter word four letter word see if you can figure that out all right, let's see if anybody has any questions. So my car broke down. Yep, a lot of you guys got that. So I can apply this, whatever the situation. Yes, so the point is, again, we understand what the situation is. There's some kind of machine failure. Maybe there's a part that's not working, but it doesn't work anymore. So there maybe is something disconnected. The problem might not be that big, but there's uh, obviously something wrong and it's not working at all. So the car broke down. My car damage, the mechanic. So what do we say other than the mechanic? Even shorter word. All right, so you can say cease to function, but to break down, or in the past tense, my car broke down. This is much faster, much easier, uh, and people will understand exactly, oh, there's like a serious problem with that. Now, we typically don't use uh, breakdown. Usually breakdown is with like a, a, a machine or something that's got moving pieces to it. So we typically don't talk about a computer breaking down. We talk about a computer crashing, uh, but this is really more talking about the, the software or there might be something broken physically about the computer, uh, but typically breakdown is more for a machine, like a tractor or if I've got something with some moving parts in it. So the roller coaster is not working right now, it's broken down. Okay, there's something wrong with it, all right? All right, I'll give you the answer to this one. So my car is at the shop. My car is at the shop. My car is at the shop. 
Everyone knows what that means. Ah, your car is at the auto mechanic. My car is at the shop. Or you can say my car is in the shop. Both of those are fine. The shop. All right. Also, uh, you, you won't really hear much about this uh, lately or in kind of more recent years, uh, but shop was also a class that people would go to uh, where they're learning about mechanical things. So like I'm taking shop in school. So you could say auto shop as well. You could, all right? But people understand what you're saying. You don't need auto, you don't need mechanic. People already understand shop. So my car is at the shop. My car is at the shop. So my car broke down, so I took it to the shop. So it's in the shop right now. Okay. Any questions about that? Those are the five examples I wanted to cover. So let's see, what did we talk about today? We had ketchup. Like when you're in a situation where you want to meet someone again uh, or speak with them again about how their life has been, you want to catch up with them. Uh, what did we also have? We have stick to. And what did we have? We had dig into. Dig into. And we had break down. And we had mess up. Plus a few other phrasal verbs that we, that we uh, discovered uh, along the way, all right? So now, what I'd like to do, understanding this, is if there is a situation you want to express or there is a sentence you would like me to convert into better, more natural English just to show you how to think more like a native, just post that in the comments right now. So even if people are not intentionally doing that, I will go back and look at comments and try to, try to tweak these a little bit, to tweak. So to tweak means to change it slightly. I want to tweak something. All right, so before that, though, I will look at, uh, let's see. Uh, Ezekiel says, do you have a few suggestions for understanding FV, uh, phrasal verbs in general? Uh, yes, so I made a whole uh, program about this. It's called the Visual Guide to Phrasal Verbs, uh, where I explain how you should be learning these, the three steps that you should follow, the basic formula for that. This is the same way natives are learning this. Uh, this is available by itself, but also, actually, it's not on our website anymore, uh, but it is included in Fluent for Life. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about that, you can click on the link in the description below this video. Uh, but in general, phrasal verbs, you should be understanding them the same way natives do and really thinking about what is the situation. Like, I can remove the cap. So if I have a, a cap on my marker, I can remove the cap or I can take off. And I can put, I can, uh, put the cap back on again. So take off, put on, all right? Just like I take off my hat and put my hat back on. Or I take off my shirt and put my shirt back on, same thing. All right. So what is the dealership again? So dealership, that's also one word. A dealership is where you would usually sell a car, but some dealerships also have car service. So they might be able to fix your car as well. So they have a sales, and then they have a maybe like a repair uh, service as well at the same shop. So I need to understand what's happening with you. Let's see, how many phrasal verbs are enough to manage for non-native speakers? 40, 50, 12, five. Again, like don't worry about trying to count the number of phrasal verbs you need to know. It's much more important to think like a native and to understand phrasal verbs like a native. Remember, phrasal verbs, if we look at all of these words, it's really just a few simple words. There's nothing complex about this, but we put them together and they create something complex. That's the idea. So if I have, let's say like a, when I was in uh, Vietnam a few years ago, I was giving this example for some learners there and I put a glass of water on the table. It was on a little tray uh, and I started pouring water into this. So I'm pouring water and then I said, can you describe what's happening? What's the situation? So the water is coming back out. What, 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 what's happening here? So the water is a flowing. So the water is flowing over or it's flowing out of the cup. Okay, so the same idea, we don't begin with the vocabulary, we begin with the situation because natives are learning it this way. They understand the situation first and then start thinking about the vocabulary. 
The trouble with learning a, a language as a second language is that you're beginning with all of this vocabulary. So you start with the vocabulary, then you try to translate that in your head, and then you look for like the English, what is the correct thing to say for that. And often the translation will sound different. So it's funny if you try to translate something from one language into, the, into another, even like using chat GPT or Google or whatever, you will often get errors because the language is it's just kind of tricky like that. Uh, so to understand it like a native, you begin seeing these visual examples, and then you might think about the same thing like, well, we're making one project over here, uh, but maybe some of our resources are flowing over into this other project we're making over here. Okay. But the point is you're learning it from the situation. So we see what's happening or we understand what's happening, and then we think of the vocabulary we would use for that. All right, anybody else here? How do you tell a girl that you want something sexual with her in a simple way? <laughs> yes, the psychotic American teacher is back. How do you tell it like, well, it depends on what you want to do. If you're, if you're you know, if, assuming she is interested in you as well, uh, often you can, I suppose, you can get signals from the girl about what she is interested in. But if you want to just ask her, like, hey, are you, do you want to have some fun? You want to have some fun? Shall we have some fun? <laughs> there are different ways you can do that. Uh, I'm sure there are better videos than this one that can go into that specifically. Uh, but the general idea is that, yes, you would just be direct if you want to do that. But typically, uh, certainly been my experience, and maybe, you know, I don't know for psychotic people as well, uh, but usually you kind of get a feeling for that sort of thing because women would rather like prefer you don't just like ask them hey like can i kiss you right now they want to just like you know go ahead and make the move make your move all right let's see if anybody else had some interesting uh less psychotic uh questions over here all right i'm late but i'll watch it on the replay i love learning phrasal verbs thanks drew says see yes my pleasure Tim Giles, I know some English words, but I don't know how to organize these words together. How do I do it? So the organization begins with the situation. That's the whole point of this video. Phrasal verbs are just one way of describing things. They're just simple, and this is really the way that native speakers are learning from the time they are children. So they're beginning with phrasal verbs because they really begin with all of these simple things. Like a young child learns dig in a sandbox or, you know, they're digging in the ground or so they're digging in their nose or something. They learn that very young. And so you would take that vocabulary, now we can connect that with something else. Like, oh, let's dig into this idea. And kids are like, oh, yeah, it's kind of like digging in the dirt. I'm going deeper. I'm understanding more about something. So they get the idea naturally. All right. So when you're, you're thinking about organizing sentences, it's often because you have like a bunch of random words in your head and then you want to, you're trying to figure out how to put them together. And that's a less natural way to do that. That's a very kind of language learner way of doing that. All right. Uh... Let's see, CVBB, how many words that I need to master English? Yes, again, I uh, answered this earlier, but it's the same idea of not worrying about the number of words you know and just how well you know the vocabulary. So just like this, children who know these words can use them well, and adults maybe who know these words but they don't understand the phrasal verbs and how they work, they will not speak as well. All right. So it's not about trying to know a lot of words. I often get comments from people like, I know like 2,000 words or 3,000 words, and I'll ask them, do you really know that word? Like, do you really know that word or that many words? And the truth is, like, there are different levels of understanding. So are, are you at like the, the lowest level where you've just heard something or maybe you can, you have awareness of it, you could recognize it, but do you really own that word? Do you really understand that word very well? Could you use that in many different situations? Okay. So uh, don't, don't worry about trying to know a lot of words. Try to understand just a few simple situations and, and learn the vocabulary people use for that. So when I'm watching Japanese people in, in my life, I'm just like, oh, okay, this situation is happening. It's like, what do they say when they, when they pick up the phone? You know, it's like, mushy, 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 mushy. You know, it's like, just, it's like, hello? Like, yeah, this is Drew, you know, there are different ways I could say it, but there are a few general things that people do for that situation. And so people teach their kids how to answer the phone. 
how to answer the phone. Like, what do I say? Oh, hello. Hello? And maybe sometimes you want to say who you are or sometimes you don't. If you're a business, typically you do want to do that. Other times you do not. All right. Let's see. Spill out. Yeah. So George uh, had another good example to spill out. You could also say spill over. Okay. All right. So remember, there's is not just one way to say something. And this is the whole magic of learning it like a native speaker. So we begin with the situation and learn all the different ways that people might do that. All right. And if you do this systematically, then you will always have something to say. It's like, I can't remember the word flow, but I do remember spill. And if you communicate confidently, even if it's not like, a, you know, it, maybe it's a, a rare phrasal verb or you just create your own phrasal verb. Look at that. It's like falling out. You know, it's kind of falling out of there. You could say that. It might not be what most people would say, but people would understand your meaning. Okay. But the point is you're thinking about it like a native. It's like I'm not trying to like, like the water is, uh, I don't know. What's it? I'm trying to think now of like a more advanced way of describing that because <laughs> I just I just wouldn't do that normally. I would just say, oh, look, it's, it's flowing over there. Or you could use the phrasal noun that be, or it's like from that, like overflow. It's overflowing. It's overflow. All right. It's coming out. Very simple. It's coming out. All right. Let's see. All right, what's, uh, what does it mean to stick out? Okay, another one. So we have stick to, but uh, another related thing, we've got stick out. So stick out, if you can imagine, like if I've got a couple of markers in my, in my hand like this, so I'm holding them, you can't really see them very well, but, what, but this one, this one is sticking out. The red one is sticking out. So you can't see the blue or the black one, but the red one is sticking out. All right, so you can imagine like a kind of stick that I have in my hand or something like that. It's, it's coming out a little bit. So this one is sticking out. I might have a hair or something that's sticking out, or I'm like, maybe I got like a big hair in my ear that's sticking out like that. All right, stick out. But remember, be careful. I know people will start asking me questions like, what does this word mean? And I will tell them, it depends. It depends on the situation. Okay, so don't begin with vocabulary. You want to begin with situations and understand what they mean. All right. All right, Brazil is in the house. And uh, if you tell her you uh, want to have some fun, she might think you want to go out to a carnival with her. And maybe, again, if uh, it depends on the tone of your voice. So if I say, hey, you want to have some fun? Maybe she thinks I want to go to a carnival. But, I, but if I'm like, hmm, hmm. You want to have some fun? Mm, you know, she probably understand. I've got like a glass of wine in my hand or something. I'm not talking about going out to the carnival. <laughs> you know, I, well, I don't know about where you live or the women around you, but like typically that's how it would work. Right, like, is it just me or is the board a little blurry? No, that's my writing. I apologize. <laughs> it's always like after it. See, it takes time. I don't like wasting any time in the video like writing clearly or, or trying to erase stuff. That's why usually there is a lot of stuff on the board by the end of these videos. All right. Hopefully you guys should be able to see everything though. All right. Uh, let's see. Yes, but after the carnival you have, you will go to have some fun. That's true. Julian, again, always coming back, always thinking, you know. I bet Julian is good with the ladies. All right, it's another good native way of saying that, like good with the ladies, good with the ladies. Let's see, thank you, your explanation is amazing. I follow you from Palestine. It's my pleasure, glad to hear. All right, how often do you have this class? So remember, this is these classes or this class. You could use either one of those. Pardon the siren. Uh, lately, I've been doing these on Monday and Thursday, my time, Japan time. So I'm in uh, Japan right now and it's Thursday morning. Uh, but I don't like having a schedule. I enjoy my freedom, and that's why I don't, you know, it's like I will continue to have a kind of general schedule, but maybe someday I will not be there. But I don't like having a schedule, and that's why I don't schedule classes like that. All right. I thought you were offline. Well, I, I mean, I guess I could be offline if you're watching this later. All right. I'm in Florida, but I'm from Brazil. Watching you online. Nice. I teach English in Brazil. I need to improve it. Morning here in China. 
to become a good English teacher. Yeah, so remember the best thing you can do for students is to think more about how to learn and understand the language like a native. You really have to put yourself in that situation and that's why I spend so much time talking about this. The typical way, the typical thing you will find on YouTube is here are, you know, 30 phrases for doing whatever. And then most of that will be forgotten. It's much better to take something, focus on it a lot to really understand that thing deeply so you can understand it like a native. All right, that's why I spend so much time reviewing things. So this is what we do in Fluent for Life. This is why we spend so much time going through things. People are like, wow, you spend so much time like on like one single conversation? It's like, yeah, because if you want to learn how to speak like a native, you should really understand that thing like a native. But as you do, you will feel much more confident and you start speaking more fluently. So the process is very quick once you start doing it like a native. So you are a good English teacher. Thanks for helping us. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Look at that. We're under an hour. Fantastic. All right. If anybody has any questions, <laughs> this is great. So I've actually, uh, this, is, this is like first video in a while that we've kept under an hour. Amazing. All right. But I will answer any last questions. Uh, but in general, I will sum up. This is another great thing. So if you're concluding a meeting or a lesson or you've been explaining something even in a casual situation, like, hey, we're going uh, hiking tomorrow. We're going to do this and this and maybe we will go to that place. If you're explaining a plan, I can say all of those things. And then make sure I'm fitting this on here too. Some so to sum up, like to add things, I'm going to say, okay, we have this and this and this. So after I give my long explanation or whatever, and I want to just give a very quick, uh, like a final, okay, I want to summarize everything to sum up, much more casual and conversational. So to sum up, uh, phrasal verbs are an excellent way to start thinking more like a native English speaker, all right? And the reason is because we're beginning with a situation and we're looking at like just looking at what's happening and thinking about what words we might use to describe that. And as we can understand this, then we can apply that thinking to more difficult situations. Like again, one thing flowing from one department into another department. So we've got so many people working on this thing. We don't need them working over here. So let's move them to this other project over here. Okay. All right, let's see if we have any final questions. Uh, please teach us prepositions. Uh, that's another thing. If you go to my channel and look for like the beginning English playlist, uh, I forget the name of it, but it's, like, it's one of the playlists on our channel, but it goes through prepositions or you can just search our channel for prepositions. All right. Uh, please, please, a shadowing, says Layla. Well, there, I mean, you, shadowing, shadowing is not as helpful as just getting lots of examples, but you will also find lots of people talking about shadowing on YouTube already. So I don't need to make another video about that. There are a lot of videos talking about the same stuff. Are you teaching uh, phrasal verbs? So yes, today we were talking about phrasal verbs as one example, but a very good, very useful example for teaching, understanding situations and helping you to think more like a native speaker. Okay. So instead, the, uh, again, the traditional way people are learning as a second language, they begin with vocabulary and then try to translate that vocabulary. But as a learner of English, as a first language, you want to begin with a situation and then learn the vocabulary for that. Okay. Uh, let's see. Rose Official says, suggest any book for five-year-old child to learn English better. Uh, I would just get Frederick. You don't really, I mean, books are helpful for that. I, I gave a... Uh, a video recently on, I think it's called These Books Get You Fluent in English. So watch that recent video. But download Frederick. You can find that in the link in the description right below this video. And that is uh, really the best way to learn uh, not only reading, but spelling, pronunciation, uh, and grammar as well, as well as lots of vocabulary. There are over 2,000 words and phrases and sentences in the app. Uh, and so you can hear, especially if you want to hear my pronunciation of all these different things, just find them in there. It's all organized and kids can actually use, uh, use the app to teach themselves. Uh, let's wrap up the class. Yes, so that's another way you could express that as well. Make it rain. Is that a phrasal verb? No, you're just making something rain. It's like make it make something. It's like make something go, make something play, make something do. Make it rain, all right? But there are different, you could use that in kind of a slang term, like 
make lots of money or be successful. Like, look at that. It's like raining money over here. Make it rain. All right. So often we will have vocabulary, but it could have multiple meanings. All right. The end says your way of teaching English is the best, but we need a little bit of speaking or imagine uh, yourself on a situation and think in your mind. Thank for your tips. Yeah. So what I usually do, I mean, when it's just me in these YouTube videos rather than me talking with someone, which I really recommend you watch. That's why we do that in Fluent for Life. We actually have conversations where you can watch natives and we analyze this and try to understand why they're doing that. But you learn all these things in steps. So you take time and understand it like a native so you can use it like a native. Uh, but yes, so if you're... I, I keep repeating myself, but it's important to remember these ideas. If you understand like a native, then you can speak like one. So if you're still learning English as a second language, you should stop doing that if you want to speak. Uh, so is it a good idea to listen without understanding? Uh, I mean, you, you will do that naturally, automatically. Sometimes you will hear, like I could be out at a, I don't know, like a party or something and hear some Japanese but not understand that. Like I'm not paying attention to it. But so it's getting into my, 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 my kind of into my brain somehow. So your brain gets a lot of information. It has to filter that information for you. Uh, so we begin when I talk about the three levels of English understanding. The first one is exposure. So that just means you're getting information somehow. So maybe you're listening to something or you heard somebody uh, or maybe they very quickly write something down or whatever. But then when you understand that a little better, you move to the awareness level. And then the highest level is ownership, what I call ownership. It just means you really know the vocabulary very well and you feel very confident about using it fluently. Most students are stuck between the level of awareness and the level of ownership because they don't know the vocabulary very well. All right. Uh, let's see. All right, good job, says Layla. Gang says, just entered into this class. It's interesting. Glad to hear it. Uh, Bavesh says, what do you think about shadowing? Every learner talk about shadowing, but do you think shadowing can improve your pronunciation? I mean, uh, some people speak highly about shadowing. I, I, I don't think it's not something I do personally, and I don't worry about uh, getting people to repeat after me. Uh, I'll explain this again. I've talked about since multiple people are asking me about shadowing now. Um, People can get into detail about how to do it, like it's a magical process or whatever, but I think it's much easier for you to just remember what did you do to get fluent in your native language. Now, I wasn't, like, when my mom spoke to me, I wasn't, like, speaking right after her or trying to repeat everything she said. What I did do was get lots of input, and so these are just understandable messages that I'm getting from lots of different people. So my dad says wash your hands and my mom says wash your hands and my brother and sister and my teachers they all say wash your hands and so rather than me trying to copy any one of those people i'm actually i'm integrating all of that into my voice all right so i'm not trying to repeat and i'm not trying to sound exactly like any one of those people but because i'm getting all of those examples it naturally builds up my own listening and pronunciation all right so I know a lot of students are, they're, they, they really lack diversity in their learning. So they only get examples from one teacher uh, or maybe they watch like one TV show, but they don't really understand it very well. So you could repeat after one person. But for me, if, if I think there's only a certain amount of time in a day, like if I have only, I don't know, 20 minutes or one hour to do something, then I'd rather get lots of examples from different people rather than just get one example and try to repeat after that person. Remember that you will be in conversations with lots of people from around the world, and it's just much easier to prepare for that situation, like having different people you're speaking with, uh, if you're listening to that when you practice. So how you practice is how you communicate, all right? So it's much better to spend more time getting all that, uh, all that input, all those understandable messages from various people, rather than just trying to take one person and repeat what they say. All right. So you can do that, but just for me, I don't recommend that because they're just they're better uses of time. Uh, Darren says, "Hi, Andrew. How's it going, leader? Uh, you're you were a very important part of my learning process. Glad to hear it. I have no questions at all. I just have a bunch of love for you right now. Glad to hear it. Glad to be loved. All right. And Diana says, "Can we talk about the use of weather rather than and either weather rather than and either?" 
Again, those are like, that would be a whole video. <laughs> and you, I'm sure you can find videos about that stuff on YouTube right now if you just like look up like weather something or, or either or whatever. Uh, but yes, yeah, so, so I'll, I'll leave that for there rather than make a whole video about that. And so we can actually keep this video under an hour. Look at that. We're a couple seconds shy of just one hour right now. But if you'd like to learn more about that, like you can certainly Google that or just look right here on YouTube and you will find lots of examples in which I recommend getting lots of examples of things like that. But remember, whether you're learning with me or anyone else, you should be doing this in English if you want to use this in English and look for people who know how to teach you like a native speaker. So rather than thinking about like what are the grammar rules and we're going to cover every example of something, we just want to understand one situation at a time. Really understand that and then you can start using it, all right? I hope I'm, I'm making it clear that fluency is developed word by word. So like I'm covering all of these things, I really should spend more time talking about each one of these, all right? I could do that. And this is like what we do in the visual guide to phrasal verbs or in Fluent for Life where we spend more time getting into things, uh, and that's how you learn to use them fluently. So don't worry about trying to learn a lot. Try to learn a few things really well, and then you can use that vocabulary no matter what you talk about. All right. All right, any last questions over here? And I think we will say goodbye. So thanks, Drew. Uh, hello again from Brazil, says Velma Sear. Julian says, I uh, improving. So I'm improving my listening skills. Uh, with different teachers, so you'd say with different teachers on YouTube from different countries and accents. Yep, glad to hear. Ananda, how do you start, how to start presentation in class? What sentence can I say for this situation? Let's begin. <laughs> there you go. Let's get started. So today we're going to talk about this, you know, if, you're, if you want to just begin the, the conversation or the presentation that way. Thank you for the lesson, says Dan. Sam Walton is back. Uh, it really baffles me why still some teachers teach English through translation. It doesn't make any sense. Well, it, it, it makes sense for, for the people trying to learn. And, and, and this, is, this is like a really a difficult thing about like the teaching versus the, the selling of, of language education. So for language, like for like selling language education and for trying to get more people watching videos, it's much better to say like, I'm going to teach you 1,000 verbs in this video. <laughs> and, like, and, and again, like people will watch that. It's like, ooh, like this video said it's going to teach me 1,000 verbs. Amazing. But of course, it, it doesn't really help you learn anything. It's just like, here's an example of this and here's an example of that and then we move on. <laughs> And so like you can't possibly teach a thousand verbs in one video unless that video is, I don't know, like 10 hours long and you're probably not going to watch that. Um, and so the translation thing, uh, people just find it, it's more, it's more comfortable to do that. And so it, it takes a lot more effort to help someone understand something as a native speaker rather than trying to understand it just through a translation. So you can imagine uh, if I am a, a parent and my child comes to me and they say, Dad, what does this word mean? I can just say, well, it, it means this, just because I'm lazy uh, or I, I don't want to take time to explain that. Uh, but if I want to take time and I really want to help them understand it, then of course I'm going to spend... Damn sirens! Uh, of course I'm going to spend more time with them and try to help them understand that because my goal is to help them use that vocabulary fluently. All right. So this is a tricky thing about YouTube, like most of the content on YouTube for language learning, and it's not just for English, but I, and I would imagine like for any language, it's usually, it's stuff to like, to get you to watch so that people get advertising revenue. And, and it's kind of, it's like kind of tricking your mind into uh, like the, the kinds of psychology things that would get you motivated to click on a video, but it might not help you learn that much. All right, so that's the that's like kind of the trade-off about like I mean the I guess the ultimate thing is can you make a good video or whatever uh, or or help someone do something that that their brain naturally wants to do but it's actually beneficial to them as well. So like especially videos where it says like like don't use the word no or don't use this word or that word or whatever. It's like you know we we know why those videos are made. Like it's it's like it's 
it's stimulating your fear response of like, oh no, what if I say the wrong thing in conversations? But, but native speakers use that vocabulary all the time. So it's very easy to check this. And the thing I always recommend people do is think about what you do in your native language. So if people told you like, don't use the word no in your native language, it's like, really? I mean, is that, is that some good advice to learn? Anyway, I'm getting off topic over here. Uh, but yeah, just so to, to understand, like it's, it's kind of comforting for a lot of people to learn through their native language. And a lot of people don't know how to teach English as a first language very well. So that's why people do it that way. All right, thanks, Ambe. All right. Uh, all right, last couple of questions. Do you suggest seeing your recorded videos or following online from now? Yeah, of course I do. <laughs> That's why I make them. Which one is good learning English by self studying or going to academy? Uh, I don't know uh, what the academy is, but I would imagine it's probably teaching uh, English the traditional way. And he says, do you have classes by Zoom? No, I do not, uh, because why would you want classes by Zoom? I mean, you, it's much better to just get lots of input rather than have one teacher explaining stuff to you. And also, you probably want to have things when you want to learn them, so not when you have to schedule a certain class or whatever. So this is Fluent for Life. And so that's why I made the whole program so people can have what they want to learn when they want to learn it, uh, and they can get fluent as quickly as possible. Uh, Zainab says, how to learn English quickly, teacher. This is how you do it. Watch this video again. George says, I keep watching those uh, VTube uh, stream, but I'm not quite sure uh, their portmanteau term can be used at a, a real live. I don't understand that question. Uh, CVBBR, you are such a great teacher. Thank you. Your accent is so clear, but why most Afro-Americans are very hard to understand their accent? It's just because you're not used to it. That's the main reason. Yes, yeah, so as like a, like a fire truck or something driving by or an ambulance. Andre says, thank you for the lesson. I completely understand what you are saying, but I'm struggling whenever I have to speak with someone. Yeah. So again, it like there, there's a, there's like a big, a big problem of not being able to communicate well. And that's because really at the base, at the, the fundamental foundation, people are still learning English as a second language. But once you start learning it as a first language, you really spend time, you really understand things well, and it's an automatic natural process that, that really gets you fluent very quickly. So that's the best advice I can give, especially if you've been learning English for a long time but still aren't communicating as well as you'd like, that's what you need to do. All right, yeah, so same thing. A lot of people, uh, just like Andre, will have that same problem. But if you would like to solve that, just click on the link in the description to learn more about Fluent for Life. Uh, again, we have a whole phrasal verb program and there are tons of phrasal verbs taught in that as well as lots of other slang, idioms, and cultural expressions, and many, many other things that will keep you very busy for a long time. All right, have a fantastic day. Thank you for joining me. Uh, glad we kept it to about uh, an hour over here. Uh, I understand what people are speaking English, but it's hard for me speaking English. Yes, again, we'll solve that problem too, says Amanda. All right, have a fantastic day, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.